chapters 11 and 12 of Beautiful Joe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. Beautiful Joe by Marshall Saunders. Chapter 11. Goldfish and Canaries. The Morris boys were all different. Jack was bright and clever, Ned was a wag, Willie was a bookworm, and Carl was a born trader. He was always exchanging toys and books with his schoolmates, and they never got the better of him in a bargain. He said that when he grew up, he was going to be a merchant, and he had already begun to carry on a trade in canaries and goldfish. He was very fond of what he called his yellow pets, yet he never kept a pair of birds or goldfish if he had a good offer for them. He slept alone in a large sunny room at the top of the house. By his own request, it was barely furnished, and there he raised his canaries and kept his goldfish. He was not fond of having visitors come to his room because, he said, they frightened the canaries. After Mrs. Morris made his bed in the morning, the door was closed, and no one was supposed to go in till he came from school. Once, Billy and I followed him upstairs without his knowing it, but as soon as he saw us, he sent us down in a great hurry. One day, Bella walked into his room to inspect the canaries. She was quite a spoiled bird by this time, and I heard Carl telling the family afterward that it was as good as a play to see Miss Bella strutting in with her breath stuck out and her little conceited air, and hear her say shrilly, Good morning, birds. Good morning. How do you do, Carl? Glad to see you, boy. Well, I'm not glad to see you he said decidedly, and don't you ever come up here again. You'd frighten my canaries to death. And he sent her flying downstairs. How cross she was. She came shrieking to Miss Laura. Bella loves birds. Bella wouldn't hurt birds. Carl's a bad boy. Miss Laura petted and soothed her, telling her to go find Davy, and he would play with her. Bella and the rat were great friends. It was very funny to see them going about the house together. From the very first, she had liked him and coaxed him into her cage, where he soon became quite at home, so much so that he always slept there. About nine o'clock every evening, if he was not with her, she went all over the house crying, Davy, Davy, time to go to bed. Come sleep in Bella's cage. He was very fond of the nice sweet cakes she got to eat, but she never could get him to eat coffee grounds, the food she liked best. Miss Laura spoke to Carl about Bella and told him he had hurt her feelings, so he petted her a little to make up for it. Then his mother told him that she thought he was making a mistake in keeping his canaries so much to themselves. They had become so timid that when she went into the room, they were uneasy till she left it. She told him that petted birds or animals are sociable and like company unless they are kept by themselves when they become shy. She advised him to let the other boys go into the room and occasionally to bring some of his pretty singers downstairs where all the family could enjoy seeing and hearing them and where they would get used to other people besides himself. Carl looked thoughtful and his mother went on to say that there was no one in the house, not even the cat, that would harm his birds. You might even charge admission for a day or two said Jack gravely, and introduce us to them, and make a little money. Carl was rather annoyed at this, but his mother calmed him by showing him a letter she had just gotten from one of her brothers, asking her to let one of her boys spend his Christmas holidays in the country with him. I want you to go, Carl, she said. He was very much pleased, but looked sober when he thought of his pets. Laura and I will take care of them, said his mother, and start the new management of them. 
very well said carl i will go then i've got no young ones now so you will not find them much trouble i thought it was a great deal of trouble to take care of them the first morning after carl left billy and bella and davy and i followed miss laura upstairs she made us sit in a row by the door lest we should startle the canaries she had a great many things to do first the canaries had their baths they had to get them at the same time every morning miss laura filled the white dishes with water and put them in the cages and then came and sat on a stool by the door bella and billy and davy climbed into her lap and i stood close by her it was so funny to watch those canaries they put their heads on one side and looked first at their little baths and then at us they knew we were strangers finally as we were all very quiet they got into the water and what a good time they had fluttering their wings and splashing and cleaning themselves so nicely then they got up on their perches and sat in the sun shaking themselves and picking at their feathers miss laura cleaned each cage and gave each bird some mixed rape and canary seed i heard carl tell her before he left not to give them much hemp seed for that was too fattening he was very careful about their food during the summer i had often seen him take up nice green things to them celery chickweed tender cabbage peaches apples pears bananas and now at christmas time he had green stuff growing in pots on the window ledge besides that he gave them crumbs of coarse bread crackers lumps of sugar cuttlefish to peck at and a number of other things miss laura did everything just as he told her but i think she talked to the birds more than he did she was very particular about their drinking water and washed out the little glass cups that held it most carefully after the canaries were clean and comfortable miss laura sat their cages in the sun and turned to the goldfish they were in large glass globes on the window seat she took a long-handled tin cup and dipped out the fish from one into a basin of water then she washed the globe thoroughly and put the fish back and scattered wafers of fish food on the top the fish came up and snapped at it and acted as if they were glad to get it she did each globe and then her work was over for one morning she went away for a while but every few hours through the day she ran up to carl's room to see how the fish and canaries were getting on if the room was too chilly she turned on more heat but she didn't keep it too warm for that would make the birds tender after a time the canaries got to know her and hopped gaily around their cages and chirped and sang whenever they saw her coming then she began to take some of them downstairs and let them out of their cages for an hour or two every day they were very happy little creatures and chased each other about the room and flew on miss laura's head and pecked saucily at her face as she sat sewing and watching them they were not at all afraid of me nor of billy and it was quite a sight to see them hopping up to bella she looked so large beside them one little bird became ill while carl was away and miss laura had to give it a great deal of attention she gave it plenty of hemp seed to make it fat and very often the yolk of a hard-boiled egg and kept a nail in its drinking water and gave it a few drops of alcohol in its bath every morning to keep it from taking cold the moment the bird finished taking its bath miss laura took the dish from the cage for the alcohol made the water poisonous then vermin came on it and she had to write carl and ask him what to do he told her to hang a muslin bag full of sulphur over the swing so that the bird would dust it down on her feathers that cured the little thing and when carl came home he found it quite well again one day just after he got back 
mrs montague drove up to the house with a canary cage carefully done up in a shawl she said that a bad-tempered housemaid in cleaning the cage that morning had gotten angry with the bird and struck it breaking its leg she was very much annoyed with the girl for her cruelty and had dismissed her and now she wanted carl to take the bird and nurse it as she knew nothing about canaries carl had just come in from school he threw down his books took the shawl from the cage and looked in the poor little canary was sitting in a corner its eyes were half shut one leg hung loose and it was making faint chirps of distress carl was very much interested in it he got miss montague to help him and together they split matches tore up strips of muslin and bandaged the broken leg he put the little bird back in the cage and it seemed more comfortable i think he will do now he said to miss montague but hadn't you better leave him with me for a few days she gladly agreed to this and went away after telling him that the bird's name was dick the next morning at the breakfast table i heard carl telling his mother that as soon as he woke up he sprang out of bed to see how his canary was during the night poor foolish dick had picked off the splints from his leg and now it was as bad as ever i shall have to perform a surgical operation he said i did not know what he meant so i watched him when after breakfast he brought the bird down to his mother's room she held it while he took a pair of sharp scissors and cut its leg right off a little way above the broken place then he put some vaseline on the tiny stump bound it up and left dick in his mother's care all the morning she sat sewing she watched him to see that he did not pick the bandage away when carl came home dick was so much better that he had managed to fly up on his perch and was eating seeds quite gaily poor dick said carl leg and a stump dick imitated him with a few little chirps a leg and a stump why he is saying it too exclaimed carl and burst out laughing dick seemed cheerful enough but it was very pitiful to see him dragging his poor little stump around the cage and resting it against the perch to keep him from falling when mrs montague came the next day she could not bear to look at him oh dear she exclaimed i cannot take that disfigured bird home i could not help thinking how different she was from miss laura who loved any creature all the more for having some blemish about it what shall i do said miss montague i miss my little bird so much i shall have to get a new one carl will you sell me one i will give you one mrs montague said the boy eagerly i would like to do so mrs morris looked pleased to hear carl say this she used to fear sometimes that in his love for making money he would become selfish mrs montague was very kind to the morris family and carl seemed quite pleased to do her a favor he took her up to his room and let her choose the bird she liked best she took a handsome yellow one called berry he was a good singer and a great favorite of carl's the boy put him in the cage wrapped it up well for it was a cold snowy day and carried it out to mrs montague's sleigh she gave him a pleasant smile and drove away and carl ran up the steps into the house it's all right mother he said giving mrs morris a hearty boyish kiss as she stood waiting for him i don't mind letting her have it but you expected to sell that one didn't you she asked mrs smith said maybe she'd take it when she came home from boston but i dare say she'd change her mind and get one there how much were you going to ask for him well i wouldn't sell barry for less than ten dollars or rather i wouldn't have sold him and he ran out to the stable mrs morris sat on the hall chair patting me as i rubbed against her in a rather absent-minded way then she got up 
and went into her husband's study and told him what carl had done mr morris seemed very pleased to hear about it but when his wife asked him to do something to make up the loss to the boy he said i'd rather not do that to encourage a child to do a kind action and then to reward him for it is not always a sound principle to go upon but carl did not go without his reward that evening mrs montague's coachman brought a note to the house addressed to mr carl morris he read it aloud to the family my dear carl i am charmed with my little bird and he has whispered to me one of the secrets of your room you want fifteen dollars very much to buy something for it i'm sure you won't be offended with an old friend for supplying you the means to get this something adam montague just the thing for my stationary tank for the goldfish exclaimed carl i've wanted it for a long time it isn't good to keep them in globes but how in the world did she find out i've never told any one mrs morris smiled and said beery must have told her as she took the money from carl and put it away for him mrs montague got to be very fond of her new pet she took care of him herself and I have heard her tell Mrs. Morris the most wonderful stories about him, stories so wonderful that I should say they were not true if I did not know how intelligent dumb creatures get to be under this kind of treatment. She only kept him in his cage at night, and when she began looking for him at bedtime to put him there, he always hid himself. She would search a short time and then sit down, and he always came out of his hiding place, chirping in a saucy way to make her look at him she said he seemed to take delight in teasing her once when he was in the drawing-room with her she was called away to speak to someone at the telephone when she came back she found that one of her servants had come into the room and left the door open leading to a veranda the trees outside were full of yellow birds and she was in despair thinking that barry had flown out with them she looked out but could not see him then lest he had not left the room she got a chair and carried it about standing on it to examine the walls and see if barry was hidden among the pictures and bric-a-brac but there was no barry there she at last sank down exhausted on a sofa she heard a wicked little peep and looking up saw barry sitting on one of the rounds of the chair that she had been carrying about to look for him he had been there all the time she was so glad to see him that she never thought of scolding him he was never allowed to fly about the dining room during meals and the table maid drove him out before she set the table it always annoyed him and he perched on the staircase watching the door through the railings if it was left open for an instant he flew in one evening before tea he did this there was a chocolate cake on the sideboard and he liked the look of it so much that he began to peck at it mrs montague happened to come in and drove him back to the hall while she was having tea that evening with her husband and little boy barry flew into the room again mrs montague told charlie to send him out but her husband said wait he's looking for something he was on the sideboard peering into every dish and trying to look under the covers he is after the chocolate cake exclaimed mrs montague here charlie put this on the staircase for him she cut off a little scrap and when charlie took it to the hall barry flew after him and ate it up as for poor little lame dick carl never sold him and he became a family pet his cage hung in the parlor and from morning till night his cheerful voice was heard chirping and singing as if he had not a trouble in the world they took great care of him he was never allowed to be too hot or too cold everybody gave him a cheerful word in passing his cage and if his singing was too loud they gave him a little mirror to look at himself in he loved this mirror and often stood before it for an hour at a time end of chapter eleven goldfish and canaries
Chapter Twelve Malta the Cat. The first time I had a good look at the Morris cat, I thought she was the queerest looking animal I had ever seen. She was dark gray, just the color of a mouse. Her eyes were a yellowish green, and for the first few days I was at the Morrises, they looked very unkindly at me. Then she got over her dislike, and we became very good friends. She was a beautiful cat, and so gentle and affectionate that the whole family loved her. She was three years old, and she had come to Fairport in a vessel with some sailors who had gotten her in a faraway place. Her name was Malta, and she was called a Maltese cat. I have seen a great many cats, but I never saw one as kind as Malta. Once, she had some little kittens, and they all died. It almost broke her heart. She cried and cried about the house till it made one feel so sad to hear her. Then she ran away to the woods. She came back with a little squirrel in her mouth, and putting it in her basket, she nursed it like a mother till it grew old enough to run away from her. She was a very knowing cat, and always came when she was called. Miss Laura used to wear a little silver whistle that she blew when she wanted any of her pets. It was a shrill whistle, and we could hear it a long way from home. I have seen her standing at the back door whistling for Malta, and the pretty creature's head would appear somewhere, always high up, for she was a great climber, and she would come running along the top of the fence, saying, Meow, meow, in a funny short way. Miss Laura would pet her, or give her something to eat, or walk around the garden carrying her on her shoulder. Malta was a most affectionate cat and if Miss Laura would not let her lick her face, she licked her hair with her little rough tongue. Often Malta lay by the fire, licking my coat or little Billy's, to show her affection for us. Mary, the cook, was very fond of cats, and used to keep Malta in the kitchen as much as she could, but nothing would make her stay down there if there was any music going on upstairs. The Morris pets were all fond of music. As soon as Miss Laura sat down to the piano to sing or play, we came from all parts of the house. Malta cried to get upstairs. Davy scampered through the hall, and Bella hurried after him. If I was outdoors, I ran in the house, and Jim got on a box and looked through the window. Davy's place was on Miss Laura's shoulder, his pink nose run in the curls at the back of her neck. I sat under the piano beside Malta and Bella, and we never stirred till the music was over. Then we went quietly away. Malta was a beautiful cat, there was no doubt about it. While I was with Jenkins, I thought cats were vermin, like rats and I chased them every chance I got. Mrs. Jenkins had a cat, a gaunt, long-legged yellow creature that ran whenever we looked at it. Malta had been so kindly treated that she never ran from anyone except from strange dogs. She knew they would be likely to hurt her. If they came upon her suddenly, she faced them, and she was a pretty good fighter when she was put to it. I once saw her having a brush with a big mastiff that lived a few blocks from us, and giving him a good fright, which just served him right. I was shut up in the parlor. Someone had closed the door, and I could not get out. I was watching Malta from the window as she daintily picked her way across the muddy street. She was such a soft, pretty, amiable-looking cat. She didn't look that way, though, when the mastiff rushed out of the alleyway at her. She sprang back and glared at him like a little fierce tiger. Her tail was enormous. Her eyes were like balls of fire, and she was spitting and snarling as if to say, If you touch me, I'll tear you to pieces. 
the dog big as he was did not dare attack her he walked around and around like a great clumsy elephant and she turned her small body as he turned his and kept up a dreadful hissing and spitting suddenly i saw a spitz dog hurrying down the street he was going to help the mastiff and malta would be badly hurt i had barked and no one had come to let me out so i sprang through the window just then there was a change malta had seen the second dog and she knew she must get rid of the mastiff with an agile bound she sprang on his back dug her sharp claws in till he put his tail between his legs and ran up the street howling with pain she rode a little way then sprang off and ran up the lane to the stable i was very angry and wanted to fight something so i pitched into the spitz dog he was a snarly cross-grained creature no friend to jim and me and he would have been only too glad of a chance to help kill malta i gave him one of the worst beatings he had ever had i don't suppose it was quite right for me to do it for miss laura says dogs should never fight but he had worried malta before and he had no business to do it she belonged to our family jim and i never worried his cat i had been longing to give him a shaking for some time and now i felt for his throat through his thick hair and dragged him all around the street then i let him go and he was a civil dog ever afterward malta was very grateful and licked the little place where the spitz had bit me i did not get scolded for the broken window mary had seen me from the kitchen window and told mrs morris that i had gone to help malta malta was a very wise cat she knew quite well that she must not harm the parrot or the canaries and she never tried to catch them even though she was left alone in the room with them i have seen her lying in the sun blinking sleepily and listening with great pleasure to dick singing miss laura even taught her not to hunt the birds outside for a long time she had tried to get it into malta's head that it was a cruel thing to catch the little sparrows that came about the door and just after i came she succeeded in doing so malta was so fond of miss laura that whenever she caught a bird she came and laid it at her feet miss laura always picked up the little dead creature pitied it and stroked it and scolded malta till she crept into a corner then miss laura put the bird on the limb of a tree and malta watched her attentively from her corner one day miss laura stood at the window looking out into the garden malta was lying on the platform staring at the sparrows that were picking up crumbs from the ground she trembled and half rose every few minutes as if to go after them then she lay down again she was trying very hard not to creep on them presently a neighbor's cat came stealing along the fence keeping one eye on malta and the other on the sparrows malta was so angry she sprang up and chased her away and then came back to the platform where she lay down again and waited for the sparrows to come back for a long time she stayed there and never once tried to catch them miss laura was so pleased she went to the door and said softly come here malta the cat put up her tail and meowing gently came into the house miss laura took her up in her arms and going down to the kitchen asked mary to give her a saucer of her very sweetest milk for the best cat in the united states of america malta got great praise for this and i never knew of her catching a bird afterward she was well fed in the house and had no need to hurt such harmless creatures she was very fond of her home and never went far away as jim and i did 
Once, when Willie was going to spend a few weeks with a little friend who lived fifty miles from Fairport, he took it into his head that Malta should go with him. His mother told him that cats did not like to go away from home, but he said he would be good to her, and begged so hard to take her that at last his mother consented. He had been a few days in this place when he wrote home to say that Malta had run away. She had seemed very unhappy, and though he had kept her with him all the time, she acted as if she wanted to get away. When the letter was read to Mr. Morris, he said, Malta is on her way home. Cats have a wonderful cleverness in finding their way to their own dwelling. She will be very tired. Let us go out and meet her. Willie had gone to this place in a coach. Mr. Morris got a buggy and took Miss Laura and me with him, and we started out. We went slowly along the road. Every little while, Miss Laura blew her whistle and called, Malta, Malta, and I barked as loudly as I could. Mr. Morris drove for several hours. Then we stopped at a house, had dinner, and then set out again. We were going through a thick wood where there was a pretty straight road when I saw a small, dark creature away ahead trotting toward us. It was Malta. I gave a joyful bark, but she did not know me and plunged into the wood. I ran in after her, barking and yelping, and Miss Laura blew her whistle as loudly as she could. Soon there was a little gray head peeping at us from the bushes, and Malta bounded out, gave me a look of surprise, and then leaped into the buggy on Miss Laura's lap. What a happy cat she was. She purred with delight and licked Miss Laura's gloves over and over again. Then she ate the food they had brought and went sound asleep. She was very thin, and for several days after getting home, she slept most of the time. Malta did not like dogs, but she was very good to cats. One day, when there was no one about and the garden was very quiet, I saw her go stealing into the stable and come out again, followed by a sore-eyed, starved-looking cat that had been deserted by some people that lived in the next street. She led this cat up to her catnip bed and watched her kindly while she rolled and rubbed herself in it. Then Malta had a roll in it herself, and they both went back to the stable. Catnip is a favorite plant with cats, and Miss Laura always kept some of it growing for Malta. For a long time, this sick cat had a home in the stable. Malta carried her food every day, and after a time, Miss Laura found out about her and did what she could to make her well. In time, she got to be a strong, sturdy-looking cat, and Miss Laura got a home for her with an invalid lady. It was nothing new for the Morrises to feed deserted cats. Some summers, Mrs. Morris said she had a dozen to take care of. Careless and cruel people would go away for the summer, shutting up their houses and making no provision for the poor cats that had been allowed to sit snugly by the fire all winter. At last, Mrs. Morris got into the habit of putting a little notice in the Fairport paper, asking people who were going away for the summer to provide for their cats during their absence. End of chapter 12, Malta the Cat.